Welcome to the next video in the evolution series. This video will be looking at evolution of Australian biota syllabus.8.5.34 describes the mechanisms found in Australian flora for pollination, seed dispersal, asexual reproduction, all with reference to local Australian examples. And as well as this, we'll be having a look at the investigation that ties in with the way that Australian flora is able to undergo different forms of pollination. So let's start off by having a look at pollination since it is the first of the dot points in this syllabus. So pollination and seed dispersal are important uh, in the two main groups of land plants, the gymnosperms, which are cone-bearing plants that have naked seeds that are not enclosed in an ovary, and angiosperms, the flowering plants that have seeds that develop from an ovary upon which fertilisation becomes a fruit. So pollination in gymnosperms is largely affected by wind, whereas angiosperms have evolved a diverse number of ways in achieving pollination by insects, other invertebrates and vertebrates, including birds, mammals, and also wind. So before we go on to have a look at pollination in particular, it would probably be a good idea to go back and have a look at the parts of flowers, because we'll be mentioning a few of these different parts as we move through. So all of the parts that are labeled here in pink correlate to the female parts of the plant. So as we can see, they run almost down straight through the middle of this particular flower. So we have the stigma, which is the uppermost part, the style, which then acts sort of like the fallopian tube that carries the pollen that lands on the stigma down to the um, ovary, which is in, sorry, which contains the ovule. The blue parts are the male part. So we have the anther being the upper part and the filament being the long part that connects that, uh, the anther to the bottom of the flower. Then other parts of the flower that we need to know about are the sepal, which are the little green leaf parts here that surround the flower bud when it's growing, and obviously the petal. So petals are important in pollination, as we'll look at in a minute, in order to attract different uh, birds, insects, or mammals to the flower. So the definition of pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. So as we said, the anther is part of the male flower or the male part of the flower. So the male part of the flower, the anther produces the pollen and that delivers the uh, pollen to the stigma, which then carries it down into the ovary where our uh, new flower then is produced. So self-pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma within the same flower. Okay, so sometimes flowers can pollinate themselves. Other times we can have cross-pollination take place. And cross-pollination is the transfer of pollen to the stigma of another plant of the same species. Cross-pollination increases the variation of characteristics in offspring and therefore is an advantage in an evolutionary sense. Cross-pollination occurs as a result of wind, birds, insects, bats, small mammals, and less commonly water and gravity. So many Australian native plants produce flowers in clusters called inflorescence, which uh, help to increase the efficiency of the flower to attract pollinators. So here we can see cross-pollination taking place where the pollen from one plant lands on the uh, stigma of another, and therefore we have genetic information from the two plants combining to create our new offspring. So eucalyptus, banksias, grevilleas, paperbarks, and bottle brushes are common examples of Australian native plants that produce these inflorescence or these flowers in groups. So this attracts pollinators and increases the efficiency of each visit by a pollinator in terms of the potential number of ovaries and ovules that may receive pollen. Lorikeets and, and honey eaters have specialized brush tongues which soak up the nectar or the pollen. So each one of these little pink long parts here on the grevillea contains the pollen or also contains the, the egg area. So we're able to increase the amount of pollination that takes place in each of those particular grevillea plants. So some, ex some Australian examples of pollination. So starting off with the ground orchid. So pollination in the ground orchid is an example of what's known as pseudo copulation. So basically what happens is male wasps mistake this orchid for a female wasp. So they land on the plant and 
Uh, so pseudo means fake, copulation means reproduction. So it um, the pollen becomes attached to the male wasp. It then moves on to the next orchid and it deposits the pollen there. The bonnet orchid is our next one, is also pollinated by a particular species of wasp. This flower emits a chemical odour that is similar to the one produced by the female wasp to attract a mate. If the wasp is not around, the orchid can grow rhizomes, which means that it's also able to reproduce asexually, but no pollination occurs and no seed is set. Next we have the mountain devil, and as we can see, the flowers are clustered in an inflorescence. They are rich in nectar, brightly coloured, and therefore they're able to attract honey eaters and bees, that then, the same as the wasp, the pollen gets at attached sorry, to their uh, fur of the honey eaters or onto the surface of the bee, and then when they move to the next plant, it gets deposited. In our fourth picture here, we have a conifer, kangaroo grass, or she-oak. So these are all wind-pollinated plant species. So generally, plants that are wind-pollinated are either cone-bearing or produce flowers that are not brightly coloured and contain little or no pollen. So, sorry, little or no perfume. So obviously, they're not attracting the animals by smell. The stigma may be feathery, which increases the surface area and therefore the chance of pollen landing on it. The stamens are often found dangling beyond the rest of the flower and this increases exposure to the wind. So as we can see here, these are the flowers of the plant and they're quite sort of almost fluffy. So you think they're easier to get picked up by the wind. And lastly here we have the grevillea and bottle brushes. So these are typically bird pollinated flowers. So they are brightly colored, often red, as birds see the red end of the visible spectrum much better than any of the others. They produce large quantities of nectar, usually in the morning, and are tough enough to withstand the weight and strength of the bill and produce little or no odour as birds do not have a good sense of smell. So now we need to move on and have a look at seed dispersal. So the seed is the main dispersal mechanism for most flowering plants. Some seeds are dispersed singly and slowly, and some seeds are dispersed in the fruit. As we can see from this picture here, seed dispersal can occur in a number of different ways. And what we're going to do is have a look again, as the dot point says, at some particular Australian examples. So seeds can be dispersed by being eaten by animals, attached to the animal's fur, or carried by the animals, dispersed by the wind, or dispersed by water. So birds such as the cassowary and the bowerbird the catbird, the mistletoe bird, and the fig bird all eat fruit and disperse seed in their droppings. Some Australian ants play an important role in the dispersal of many native plant seeds. The, uh, the peas and wattles have special outgrowths from the seeds that some ants eat after they have carried the seed some distance to their nest. The seed itself is generally undamaged, but some species do eat the seeds. So obviously by the different organisms either eating and dropping the seeds somewhere else or carrying them on their fur means that these seeds are going to be able to be spread over great distances. Winged seeds are common in many native plants such as banksias and hakeas. The wings assist the seeds to become dispersed by wind or to flutter down from the trees to the ground. Many common weeds such as the dandelion have seeds that are dispersed great distances by the wind. Okay, so we can see here, this is a perfect example of these wings that this seed pod has, and that obviously helps them travel great distances being carried when being carried by the wind. And we've all picked one of these um, plants and blown this, the, uh, the white part off. And what you're actually doing is helping to disperse the seeds of that plant, which is actually a weed, because those tiny little tops of each of those little um, sort of bits that stick out contains the seed for this plant. Uh, seeds can also be dispersed by water. So this obviously uh, basically is contained to trees that live along water bodies. And what happens is the woody material that encloses the seed changes the density of the seed and therefore allows them to float. So a perfect example of this are the mangrove seeds that live in estuaries. So mangroves live in an environment where water is constantly coming in and out. So when the seeds drop, those seeds are able to float. They begin their process of germination while they're still in the water. And then when the water level drops and the seed gets deposited in the mud, 
it's then able to begin to grow. And lastly, one last form of seed dispersal is bursting or explosion. So some plants such as peas, gorse and flax have seed pods that dry out once the seeds are ripe. And basically what happens is this is a bit of a combination between bursting and wind. So when the seed pods have become dry, they split open, the seeds scatter onto the ground, and then we can have these other forms of dispersal taking place, whether they're picked up by animals or they're dispersed by the wind. So the third form of reproduction we needed to look at was asexual reproduction. So this is reproduction that occurs by mitotic cellular division so that the offspring are genetically identical to the parents. Mitotic cellular division provides little opportunity for new chromosome combinations to combine. So therefore, we're back to this idea of having limited variety, limited variation within the population. So a few examples of Australian species that undergo asexual reproduction are runners. So runners are horizontal stems that grow from the parent plant, but they grow above ground. And basically what happens, the root grows out from the main plant, and then when the terminal bud touches the ground, so the end touches the ground, they take root and produce new plants. So two examples of these are the beach scaviola, which form mats on sand dunes. So if you've ever been to the beach and seen almost like this picture down here, that green covering that covers all of the sand dune, and if you actually try to pick up a piece of it, you find that it's all connected. So you pull up one piece and then the root travels along the surface of the sand and then you find that you can pull up another piece because that next part has taken root, even though um, you're not supposed to do that because these mats are now being used to help to reduce erosion in sand dunes. Okay, another example is scurvy weed, which is a herb found in moist forests and woodlands. Another form of asexual reproduction in plants is rhizomes. So these are underground stems that grow horizontally. The terminal bud then turns upwards to produce the flowering shoot and the lateral buds may grow out to form new rhizomes. So again, these sort of grow outwards from the main plant. And these rhizomes help to help plants to reproduce and regenerate, particularly after fire. So a specific example of this is the bracken fern, which is in this picture at the bottom here, which is a hardy native fern found in sclerophyll forests that quickly appear after an area has been burnt. So what actually happens is the plant, the top of it appears to be burnt, but it's sent out all these underground stems, which can survive the heat because they're underground. And then after fire, they're able to pop back up again. And lastly, the last uh, type of asexual reproduction we're going to look at are roots with suckers. So a sucker is a, short, is a shoot that grows from an underground root. So plants that reproduce from suckers can become problematic as they can spread quickly. So uh, roots with suckers occur in some grevillea and some acacia species such as these two that are at the bottom here. And the reason why they can be a problem is that people think if they remove the parent plant that they're not going to have an issue because they've removed the, the main root. But because these other roots have traveled out and began to form new plants, you actually need to be able to remove as many of them as possible in order to stop them from uh, taking over an area. So basically the investigation that goes with this is 8.5.3C. Plan, choose equipment or resources and perform a first-hand investigation to gather and present information about flowers of native species of angiosperms to identify features that may be adaptations for wind and insect, bird or mammal po pollination. So basically the aim is to identify features of native species of flowering plants, basically taken straight from the syllabus dot point. So the method you're going to use is you'll be observing each of the plant species provided using the hand lens and or the stereo microscope. And you'll make quantitative observations, so those with numbers and units, such as length, width, etc., of features of the plant, along with qualitative observations that you will make note of in your results table. Then once you've done that, you'll be able to use this table here to see if you can work out what type of pollination each of the different plant species that are provided to you undertake whether it's wind pollinated bird pollinated insect pollinated and we'll also be having a look at those that are pollinated by small mammals and that brings us to the end of this video thank you for watching